Hey, this is John Willis, Bachigaloop. Um, a lot of you probably know that I've been working on a book about Dr. Deming really almost 10 years now. Um, two years ago, I got really serious about the work and the pandemic hit and I decided, you know, if you're ever going to write this book, you should write it. I started working with a fabulous consultant, uh, Derek Lewis. You actually get to hear his phenomenal voice. He's been my partner for two years. Uh, it took about a year to write, and I thought at the end of that year, I thought I was done naively, and I found that a year later with five drafts that I, you know, I probably could go on for another five years. Uh, but I finally have uh, worked with a publisher. We'll have some really good news on that, and if all goes well, the audio version, the final audio version and Kindle version should be out this summer. Uh, looks like there's a little bit of a shortage in, in terms of printing and supply chain issues, so the, the paperback or the might not be till the end of the year. Uh, the one thing I wanted to point about this edition is two things. One, it is an early version, so you might, when we finally get you know production and publication of the Audible version, uh, there'll be changes. And But the second two is... I used um, a, what I would call a dramatic version. I added some voiceovers and sort of minor sound effects just to see uh, if there could be an interesting emphasis. I really hope you enjoy the, the it's basically the first three chapters, the, the finished book. Um, if you really are interested in getting an early copy of the finished book, you just reach out to me at bachikaloop at gmail.com. Um, but again, it will probably be a, a non for distribution version, and um, and you know, with the caveat, things may change, and will change in the final version. Uh, but um, it's the first three chapters, um, and the actual final book is actually twenty chapters as it stands right now, and three hundred fifty pages, which will probably be shortened. Anyway, I really hope you enjoy again, John Willis, Botchkaloop, Botchkaloop at gmail dot com. Why dimming still matters. How His System of Profound Knowledge Shaped the World by John Bachigalup Willis The right quality and uniformity are foundations of commerce, prosperity, and peace. Chapter 1. What Ed Said As the black-and-white film clip played across the tiny TV screen, the caption read, Tokyo, 1945, the aftermath of a bitter conflict, a literal war zone. A city of millions reduced to rubble and ashes, half its population lost before the fight's inevitable end. The summer of 1980, when that scene aired, Kevin lived with his grandparents in Washington, D.C. Though raised in the city, his family had moved to California the year before, and he'd enrolled at UCLA. He'd come back to D.C. to work before he began his sophomore year that fall. For some time now, Kevin had been perplexed by a phone call from his mother weeks earlier. She could barely contain her excitement as she proudly gave him the news. His grandfather was to appear in a primetime NBC News special episode. Knowing her father always shunned the spotlight, she extracted a promise from Kevin that he would make his grandfather watch it. But why? Why would millions of people be interested in my quiet, gentle, hard-working grandfather, he wondered. When he'd asked his grandfather directly, all Kevin got were polite deflections and a quick change of subject. The man was generally quiet and reserved, but not downright secretive. The special episode's name didn't help much. If Japan can, why can't we? Well, not about his grandfather's involvement, at least. On the other hand, anyone who heard the episode's name knew exactly what it was about. The Japanese takeover of American industry. To understand how this situation came about... The Tarnish of the Golden Age... Whereas the rest of the industrialized nations of the world lay in ruins from World War II, the U.S. was left virtually untouched. As the only game in town, U.S. industry reigned supreme. Factories couldn't churn out cars, radios, and other manufactured goods fast enough. Quality wasn't a concern. The only real challenge was keeping up with global demand. While Europe and the rest of the world reeled from the aftermath of the second globally encompassing conflict, America entered the golden age of capitalism. From 1948 to about 1970, the nation ruled supreme. Its economy, manufacturing sectors, military, and ability to shape world history and world politics were second to none. It was a heady time to call yourself an American. Well, a golden age for the average Joe, and decidedly not for women, people of color, and other minorities. 
The 70s knocked the country off its pedestal. The USSR dominated the 1972 Munich Olympics. The U.S. Olympians went home nearly empty-handed. Despite Nixon proclaiming Vietnam a success, the prolonged war and withdrawal demoralized the military and America itself. A few months later, the 1973 oil crisis, engineered by a handful of developing countries, brought the most powerful nation on earth to a halt. The Iranian hostage crisis embarrassed the U.S. on a global stage. Nationalistic feelings of pride, superiority, and modern manifest destiny had given way to uncertainty, anger, and fear. And Japan. Outside observers called it the Japanese economic miracle, and for good reason. Upon its surrender to the Allied forces in 1945, Japan was a ghost of its former self, its people on the brink of starvation and facing a humanitarian crisis. An estimated 90% of its industrial capacity had been wiped out. Not only had the entire country been bombed to nearly nothing, but it didn't have the means to rebuild. What meager production it could muster was of such low quality that Made in Japan became a joke the world over. While the U.S. stayed there after the war to oversee the dismantling of the Japanese military from 1945 to 1952, goods were stamped Made in Occupied Japan. For the first couple of years of the occupation, America helped Japan simply survive. It wasn't until U.S. policy shifted that it began to rebuild what was left of Japan. During those years, a number of experts were brought in to advise the new Japanese government and what little remained of its industry. Twenty-three years after its surrender, no one laughed when the island nation surpassed West Germany to become the largest economy in the world after the U.S., a position it would hold for over 40 years. By the 70s, the word Japanese conjured images of advanced technologies, the best electronics, the most reliable appliances, and the highest quality cars. The oil crisis spurred many Americans to buy foreign cars over Detroit, home to the big three, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. Better gas mileage, greater dependability, superior engineering and craftsmanship, a Toyota topped a domestic-made car in every way. The land of Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller was no longer the manufacturing capital of the world. That title had been claimed by the land of sushi and samurai. Cars were the final straw. Americans could tolerate Japan manufacturing cheap commodities like spoons and tin cans. Few cared about the computer and electronics industries, much less losing them to some rocky little island. They could stomach Japan making better toasters and washing machines. But Americans have a special relationship with cars. They're not like a tool or a household appliance. They're a source of national pride and a part of America's identity as much as baseball and apple pie. As Japan began overtaking one industry after another, you can almost hear the average Joe muttering, well, at least we still have our cars. When the U.S. lost even that, that's when the everyday, red-blooded American realized the country was in trouble. How had this happened? How had Made in Japan gone from joke to juggernaut? How had the vanquished country come to usurp its conqueror? It was astonishing. It was impossible. It was nothing short of a miracle. From business leaders to politicians to factory floor hands, everyone shared the same bewilderment. They began to ask the question, if Japan can do it, why can't the U.S.? But still, Kevin's question was, what did his grandfather have to do with any of this? The Miracle Maker When the time came for, if Japan can, why can't we, to air, Kevin dutifully went to the cramped basement of his grandparents' little brownstone. There sat his grandfather, almost 80 years old now, at his desk working with the vigor and determination of someone a fraction of his age. Being the voracious reader and lifelong learner he was, the older gentleman probably had that day's copy of the Washington Post. One op-ed began with this. Have you looked at the economic news lately and wondered who really did win World War II? Somebody at NBC News evidently did and came up with If Japan Can, Why Can't We? An NBC white paper on Japan's burgeoning productivity and our lagging one to be aired tonight at 9.30 on Channel 4. It is a thoughtful, often depressing, and sometimes fascinating examination of what makes and maintains a work ethic and why we may end up freezing to death in the dark, but the Japanese won't. Kevin announced... It's time for the documentary. 
that climbed the narrow, rickety staircase to join his grandmother and great-aunt around the tiny TV. It began with the aforementioned black-and-white clip of the ruins of Tokyo in 1945, followed by another black-and-white clip from the formal surrender of Japan. The next scene showed an industrial smelter pouring liquid metal with the caption, Tokyo, 1980. Then the clips came in rapid succession. Scenes of busy factories and electronics labs, automated robots and cars rolling off assembly lines, the very images that might spring to mind whenever anyone mentioned Japan. Then the overlay of the episode's title. If Japan can, why can't we? Suddenly, Dr. William Edwards Deming appeared on screen, apparently in the middle of an interview. In his quiet, measured tone, he asked, So, what can we do to work smarter, not harder? That was it. While the other three people in the kitchen nearly burst with pride, Kevin's grandfather seemed embarrassed. He made as if to go back to his basement office to keep working, but they cajoled him into watching the rest. At nearly the halfway point through the program, there was still no further mention of dimming. It was an uncomfortable 30 minutes, as Kevin would later note. Then came a Japanese manager giving a speech. Productivity gains were taught to us by Americans. Uh, We are very fortunate to have America as a good teacher, and we always try to be a very good student. And that's what makes it possible for us to be somewhat competitive in an international market with U.S. industries. At the words somewhat competitive, the audience began to laugh. The speaker, Joji Arai, manager of the Japan Productivity Center, was being modest and humble. But Japanese manufacturers outclassed their U.S. counterparts to the point it was laughable, literally. The next cutaway changed everything. One second, laughter at Mr. Arai's understatement of the century. The next, a slow, solitary voice that everyone around the TV knew so very well. Let's see. The first time that I went there to teach industry, I taught 450 engineers in several cities. Tokyo, Nagoya, and Fukuoka. As the screen showed clips of the family's beloved gentle giant smiling and shaking hands with Japanese executives, the voiceover of narrator reporter Lloyd Dobbins explained. W. Edwards Deming first went to Japan in 1950 to teach industrial productivity through statistical analysis. He was so successful that Japan's annual award for productivity is called the Deming Prize. It is one of the most coveted awards in Japan, And the medal that goes with the award is a profile of Dr. Deming, an American. We have said several times that much of what the Japanese are doing is what we taught them to do. And the man who did most of the teaching is W. Edwards Deming. Some say the NBC special was the beginning of the quality revolution. At the very least, it brought the topic from the fringes to the mainstream. In just 75 minutes, it upended how the U.S. and the world saw business and industry, sparking a wholesale adoption of Japanese methods and management. It dispelled many of the myths and misunderstandings surrounding the Japanese economic miracle and revealed one of the miracle makers. No sooner had the documentary concluded than the telephone began to ring. For Kevin's grandfather, life was never quite the same after that. History repeats itself. America was stunned to find that the cause of its angst lived in a modest D.C. townhome just blocks away from the very center of the nation's capital. Could the octogenarian make a comeback as its savior? U.S. business leaders clamored to find out. For the next 13 years, Ed traveled from coast to coast delivering his lectures on productivity and management. Ford, GM, Xerox, Procter & Gamble, AT&T, The New York Times— It seemed everyone wanted a seat at the feet of the master. But history has a funny way of repeating itself. The lectures he gave were almost the same ones he'd delivered 30 years prior in Japan, and in the U.S. 10 years before that. Yes, Ed had been down this road 40 years ago after the U.S. joined the fight against the Axis powers. America's workforce had traded their suits and coveralls for uniforms and helmets. Whether by volunteering or by draft, Many of the country's able-bodied men, skilled workers and experienced managers alike, departed their homeland for foreign shores. 
At the same time, the country had to ramp up its industrial production of, well, everything. From battleships and bombers to boots and bandages, the Allied powers needed as much as possible as fast as possible. And with the fate of the free world in the balance, there could be no compromise on quality. A defective washing machine meant drying the clothes on the line. A jammed gun might mean death. While G.I. Joe fought in Europe and the Pacific, Rosie the Riveter filled his shoes. Thousands of women joined the workforce for the first time, eager to do their part, including my own mother, Virginia. The day before Pearl Harbor, she couldn't find a job in New York to save her life. In the days after, she and hundreds of other young women were immediately hired at the famed Brooklyn Naval Yard. Faced with the paradox of inexperienced, unskilled workers like Virginia, who were required to produce more, faster, and better, the U.S. Secretary of War took action. He convened an emergency technical committee composed of six experts from across the country to create standards and procedures for producing war supplies. Ed was one. Both Allied and Axis powers had advanced technology, brilliant strategists, and their fair share of valiant soldiers. But according to the American general overseeing the war production effort, the Allies didn't win because of D-Day or the atom bomb. The Axis powers didn't lose because of a misstep or overreaching. Victory came because the U.S. outproduced the rest of the world. By the end of the war, the U.S. had supplied two-thirds of the Allies' war needs, from tanks to tents to toothbrushes. The quantity, and perhaps more importantly the quality, of American manufactured goods rose dramatically. This despite the absence of millions of skilled American workers and experienced managers. It's no stretch to say that the Allies won because of the quality produced by Rosie the Riveter. Rosie outmanufactured her male predecessors using something called Statistical Process Control, or SPC. She learned from two sources. The first was from the Emergency Technical Committee's standards and procedures distributed throughout the country. The second was from SPC trainers. Starting at Stanford University, Deming trained over 2,000 people in SPC methods. They, in turn, taught 30,000 additional trainers. These thousands upon thousands of SPC evangelists went forth and spread the gospel, as it were, to Rosie's supervisors and Rosie herself. General Knudsen, in charge of the domestic war effort, later said it like this, We won because we smothered the enemy in an avalanche of production, the likes of which he had never seen nor dreamed possible. The Allies won because of Rosie, and Rosie's stunning success had Deming's fingerprints all over it. Then G.I. Joe came home and once again donned his business suit or factory coveralls. He took one look at how the war was won and said, Forget all that. We're going back to the way we've always done it. It took over 30 years to realize his mistake. In the NBC special, Lloyd Dobbins said of Deming, In his own country, he is not widely recognized. Once G.I. Joe returned, he had no use for Deming's methods. Shunned by his countrymen, Deming looked elsewhere for eager students, and there was no one more eager than the Japanese. To put a fine point on it, America was the manufacturing capital of the world during World War II. After the war, Joe kicked Deming out of his factory and went back to his old ways. Deming took the exact lectures he'd delivered at Stanford and presented them to the Japanese. Thirty years later, Japan knocked America off its manufacturing pedestal. G.I. Joe's son and grandson sat around wondering, how did this happen? Maybe we should learn from the Japanese. Better late than never, I guess. The story of profound knowledge. What did Ed do in Japan? He shared the pieces of profound knowledge he'd gleaned from his experiences. The term is capitalized because it's a collection of fundamental truths about how any system or process can be transformed into something greater. Ed wouldn't say that he created the elements of profound knowledge. Rather, he discovered them over the course of his life. The four pieces are 1. A theory of knowledge. How do we know what we believe we know? 2. A theory of variation. How do we analyze and understand what we know? 3. A theory of psychology. How do we account for human behavior? And four, an appreciation of systems and systems thinking. Are we seeing the bigger picture? 
these four elements, these four ways of seeing the world, would coalesce into a lens through which we should view the world. Armed with this lens, any person or entity could achieve transformational change in any system or process. To say it in a Pollyanna-ish way, this lens is a proven way to make the world a better place. Ed began his journey as a mathematical physicist right at the time Einstein's and others' theories about the nature of the universe were coming into vogue. Whereas their intellectual predecessors saw physics in black and white terms, this new school proved that reality was more about probabilities than certainty. This gave Ed an appreciation for the complexity of reality and was a clue that eventually put him on to one piece of profound knowledge, that of an appreciation for complex systems. In his 20s, he interned at the leading industrial site in the nation, Hawthorne Works. Unlike the company towns of its time, Hawthorne was founded on workers having more autonomy in their personal lives. This was Ed's first glimpse into another element of profound knowledge, that of a theory of psychology. He saw how workers being internally motivated changed how they interacted with the manufacturing process whereas the other managerial ideologies of the day tried to minimize the role of the worker in the system, Ed saw how working with human psychology instead of against it created a better overall system. In his 30s, Ed found a mentor, Dr. Walter Schuert. The mentor introduced Ed to the concepts of C.I. Lewis around pragmatism and a theory of knowledge. Essentially, this school of thought approached the world via the scientific method, constantly testing ideas and reevaluating hypotheses. The key point is that the difference between information and knowledge is that knowledge requires prediction. Though it sounds straightforward, in my own experiences, some of the largest organizations in the world still don't approach situations with this mindset. Stewart also grounded Deming in a theory of variation. In his work with physics, Deming already knew that the very nature of reality is random. From Schuert, Ed solidified his thinking around variation, seeing randomness as inherent to any system or process, from stuffing envelopes to predicting radioactive isotope decay. Variability is a fact of life. Deming gives us a great, simple example of variability. If you ask three people to count the number of people in the room, you might get three different answers. The answers depend on each counter's definition of the room. Should the count include the people serving food or just the guests? Should the count include the open patio attached to the room? There are many questions where there are no exact answers. Deming believed that there were many things that cannot be measured, yet that still must be managed, and that managers must make decisions about. Schuert provided Deming with one of the most important tools he'd ever receive the knowledge of statistical process control. In his 40s, Ed found himself working for the Department of Defense. Through various colleagues and peers, he was baptized into systems thinking, seeing that everything was part of a larger system, from data input to building fighter planes to coordinating a nationwide effort. The complexity he'd encountered in his physics studies turned out to be a natural law of human life. After World War II ended, Ed traveled to Japan to help with nationwide rebuilding efforts. By this time, he was well-grounded in three pieces of profound knowledge. Knowledge, variation, and systems thinking. But it was in Japan that he gained an appreciation for the final cornerstone of profound knowledge, a theory of psychology. In the Japanese, Ed found a culture of inherent respect between manager and employee. Workers were motivated on a personal level to produce the best products they possibly could. The poster child that typified the best of Japanese business practices was Toyota. In truth, Japan influenced Ed as much as Ed influenced Japan. For instance, Toyota's world-class approach to business, called the Toyota Way, is a beautiful fusion of Eastern and Western ideas, bringing together and bringing out the best in both. A key point of Deming's theory of psychology is that all people are different, and you can't manage with a one-size-fits-all approach. In his 60s and 70s, Ed languished in relative obscurity outside of Japan. It wasn't until the NBC documentary catapulted him to fame that the U.S. began taking note of his efforts. By this time, Japan was an economic juggernaut, and American businesses were eager to learn from their eastern counterparts. In his 80s, Ed was finally getting his due, traveling all over the world, teaching the largest organizations on the planet. 
Just before he passed away in 1993, he published The New Economics. In it, he presented his masterwork, the culmination of his life's experiences. He brought together all four pieces of profound knowledge and named it the System of Profound Knowledge, or SOPK. Just as systems thinking was a component of it, SOPK could only work as a system itself with the four different elements working together as one single lens through which to view the world. This highlight reel of Ed's achievements barely scratches the surface of all the ways he's influenced the world today. From the balance of power in the U.S. Capitol to NASCAR racing and globalization, the ripples of his work seem almost endless. While his story is fascinating by itself, this book isn't strictly about his life. Rather, it's the story of the gift he gave the world, a way of thinking that can be applied to any facet of life or work. When Ed worked with Ford Motor Company, he didn't try to fix specific problems, although he often did in the course of his true aim, to embed SOPK in the minds of everyone who worked there. Ed's mission was to work himself out of a job. He wanted to equip the people inside the company with the tools they needed to profoundly change the way Ford worked. When he stood before the collective remaining industrial base of Japan in 1950, he didn't try to fix individual companies' problems. He taught them principles and gave them a different way of thinking about the work they did each day. He didn't want them to change their practices so much as he wanted to change their mindsets. The same with American manufacturers during wartime. It wasn't enough that everyone pulled together to create as much war supplies as possible. The workforce and entire business had significantly changed, requiring a massive shift in how they operated day to day. The same thing 40 years later. The American economy had profoundly changed, requiring a change in how organizations operated. His system of profound knowledge was about learning how to bring about profound change on your own. That's why even three decades after his death, we're still using his teachings as we head into the unknowns of the future. I'm a software developer. I can tell you horror stories about the cyber terrorists in the digital Wild West. We've never faced what we do today, and we need help figuring it out. I and millions of others use Ed's methods to arrive at profound insights we otherwise would never have found on our own. This book chronicles not only the arc of Ed's life, but that of his thinking as well. The roots of SOPK began even before he was born, reaching a beautiful culmination right at the time he went to college. Had he been born a few years earlier, I'm not sure he would have been exposed to this new kind of thinking, quantum physics, as he was. Had he not been raised in a hard scrabble life and interned at the cutting-edge social experiment that was Hawthorne Works, I don't know that his system would have been as humane and human-centered as SOPK came to be. Had he not taken a job as a mathematical physicist, I wonder if he would have had the opportunity to learn from the world's foremost expert on variation and how it shows up in absolutely every facet of existence. Had he not been an expert in statistical surveys, he wouldn't have had the opportunity to travel to Japan, and especially not at the crucial moment of a devastated and demoralized country trying to rebuild its economy, looking for hope and inspiration. This book is truly about how the lens of profound knowledge was found. It just so happens that its discoverer was a man named Ed. Part 1. Foundations of Profound Knowledge to understand profound knowledge, we must first look at the foundational elements that formed Deming's early thinking, eventually leading him to his masterwork, The System of Profound Knowledge. Chapter 2. Bound and Non-Determined Einstein possessed a form of intelligence that moved beyond normal ways of formal thinking, and in doing so, he often disturbed the drowsy status quo. Dr. Deming was also one of those disturbers, one of the leaders of the Monkey Wrench Gang. And, like Einstein, he was one of the gifted few who had the courage to tell the emperor the truth about his new clothes, Frank Vole. Ed Deming's one childhood claim to fame was when Buffalo Bill recognized him in the crowd during a performance of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show outside Los Angeles. Edwards, as his family called him, was visiting his cousins. The notoriously flamboyant showman knew the boy from Cody, Wyoming, by sight, if not by name. Buffalo Bill was arguably the most world-famous living American at the time, having extensively toured the U.S. and then Europe, performing before Queen Victoria herself twice. His act made him not only famous, but rich. 
But Buffalo Bill wanted to be taken seriously as a legitimate businessman instead of a circus act. He used his money and influence in an enterprise to create the largest undertaking of its kind ever attempted in the West, using irrigation to create an agricultural empire stretching along the Shoshone River. He began by incorporating a small town in 1896 about 50 miles east of Yellowstone National Park. Colonel William Frederick Buffalo Bill Cody humbly named it after himself. Life in and around Cody, Wyoming revolved around Bill, and Bill was usually in and around the sweetest hotel that ever was. Named after his daughter, the Irma not only housed travelers but served as Bill's headquarters, comprising two personal suites and his professional offices. His hotel was, in effect, the heart of his endeavor. When he built it, he envisaged something akin to an African city serving as a staging point for safari expeditions, perhaps like Zanzibar or Mombasa. He foresaw hosting European nobility hunting big game, East Coast financiers looking for potential investments, and opportunists from everywhere investigating the mining and ranching possibilities. The bread and butter of the Irma, however, would be the promised flood of newcomers flocking to settle the soon-to-be verdant plains. Shortly after the opening of the Irma in 1902, the Demings arrived from Sioux City, Iowa. The 33-year-old father, William, had been trained as a law clerk but now sought to make his fortune on the frontier. He arranged for temporary employment with an attorney already in Cody, then moved his wife and two toddling boys from the breadbasket of America to the barren badlands of Wyoming. His two young children had to get used to their new surroundings. With nothing but cactus and sagebrush, the little boys, too poor for shoes in the summer, spent most of their time pulling cactus needles out of their feet. The town was still in its infancy. There wasn't enough legal work to keep the young father employed full-time. Needing a way to support his family in the meantime, he found a job at the Irma as a sort of -of jack-of-all-trades. In addition to his wages, the hotel also provided them with a small house on the grounds. So, of course, Buffalo Bill recognized Edwards and his little brother at the L.A. performance. The two little boys had been fixtures at the Irma for years. The kids idolized this larger-than-life character, entranced by the long-haired, mustachioed, blonde showman. Unfortunately for Buffalo Bill, his first attempt to make a go of his Cody-based irrigation empire failed. However, he got a chance at redemption in 1905, when the federal government began a massive public works project via the U.S. Reclamation Service, a sort of predecessor to the Tennessee Valley Authority, aimed at irrigating 90,000 acres to turn the semi-arid Bighorn Basin into fertile farms. This necessitated the construction of the Shoshone River Dam 25 miles northeast of Cody, around the settlement of Powell. Once completed, the concrete arch gravity dam itself a predecessor to the Hoover Dam, was the tallest dam in the world. The area around Powell was open to homesteaders, and in 1906, Mr. William Deming applied for and received 40 acres of farmland on the edge of town, or at least what everyone hoped would be farmland one day. In the meantime, they eked out what living they could out there where the Great Plains met the Rocky Mountains. Decades later, Ed recalled his family's hard scrabble life. No. I remember our house in Powell, roughly 1908 to 1912, was a tar paper shack about the size of a freight car. Snow blew in through the cracks in the door and in the windows. Of course, electricity and indoor plumbing were out of the question. He recollected owning a cat at the time that slept with him and his brother, keeping them warm at night. The Shoshone River Dam wasn't completed until 1910, But with or without irrigation, William was never a successful farmer. He once remarked, A farmer makes his money on the farm and spends it in town. An agriculturalist makes his money in town and spends it on the farm. I'm an agriculturalist. To make ends meet, Mrs. Pluma Deming, nay Edwards, taught piano and voice lessons on her Steinway Parlor grand piano. It must have seemed an out-of-place piece of luxurious refinement in that tar paper shack in the middle of those windswept plains. William continued to do some legal work in the area. A very significant quality which both of his parents seemed to model was that of intellectual curiosity and a love of learning. 
Edwards was raised in an atmosphere that included both left brain and right brain learning. His mother provided the right brain perspective, the synthetic and creative aspects of learning, through music, while his father tended more toward the left brain cognitive perspective. The atmosphere created by Deming's parents served as the basis for his intellectual achievements and quite likely spurred the qualities which contributed to his success, an intense work ethic, devotion to spouse and family, a love of music. With these traits as fundamental to the person of Deming, he was positioned in character to thrive. This environment set the course of Deming's life. He became a philomath, a lifelong learner and boundary spanner a master of engineering and statistics, while also a musician, composer, and linguist. Because of his love of learning and his somber demeanor, the family even came to, prophetically, nickname him The Professor. The eggs, milk, and vegetables that kept the family alive came from their chickens, cow, and garden. Despite their efforts, it wasn't always enough. Late in his life, Deming would recall his childhood. Oh. I remember my mother taking my brother and me by the hand, prayed for food. Elizabeth, his younger sister and the first baby born in Powell, later noted, We didn't have much, but nobody had anything. His upbringing would give him a unique perspective about the -the on-the-ground reality of the working class that managers, and especially those from more privileged backgrounds, couldn't appreciate. Ed went to work almost as soon as he was old enough to hold a hammer. Sometimes all the family had was the little boy's wages of $1.25 from doing chores around Powell's hotel. When he was a little older, he earned $10 a month for lighting the town's five gasoline street lamps. Sometimes the family's meal was fish Edwards caught. In addition to providing legal services, William later began traveling, selling real estate and insurance. Over time, his business grew enough that the Demings were able to move out of the little tar shack on the prairie and into a slightly better home. The hardship of his family's subsistence existence and his frequent role as the household's sole provider shaped Edwards forever. Though poor, his parents were well-educated and poured their knowledge, and perhaps thirst for more, into their child. This all resulted in a young man who was serious, studious, and diligent. Down at the other end of the Great Plains, the Mexican border war waged from 1910 to 1919, fought by such legends as Pancho Villa and General John Pershing, who would shortly lead the U.S. forces in Europe during World War I. Things came to a head with the Tampico Affair. U.S. sailors had come ashore to the Mexican town to secure supplies. Instead, they found themselves detained by Mexican federales. Their commanding officer, Admiral Henry Mayo, demanded the sailors' immediate release, but then he went further. He demanded the Federales issue a formal apology, take down the Mexican flag, replace it with the American flag, then salute the stars and bars, plus a 21-gun salute. To the complete and utter surprise of no one, this did not go over well. After their refusal, President Woodrow Wilson went before Congress to seek approval of an armed invasion of the country. The legislation passed. There was a nationwide call for enlistment. A number of young men from Powell volunteered. The entire town threw a going-away party before the would-be warriors boarded the train to go enlist in nearby Cheyenne. Elizabeth gave her oldest brother a ten-cent chocolate bar, something of a luxury on the frontier. True to his nature, Edwards handed it back. To her delight, he returned on the next train from Cheyenne, having been rejected for military service. Apparently, some recruiter believed soldiers should be older than 14. How Newton's Apple and Schrodinger's Cat set the stage. The year before the Demings moved from the Irma to the Tar Shack, a theoretical physicist published four groundbreaking papers that challenged the laws of physics. One of the papers held the seeds of what would become the world's most famous formula, E equals mc squared. Before Einstein, everyone relied on Sir Isaac Newton's explanations to understand how the physical world works. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, etc. Einstein showed the world that physics is like the Korean DMZ. Newton's laws only applied in a certain jurisdiction. Past that border, you found a whole other world. That line was the atom, the basic building block of all matter. Newtonian physics governed the apple. If you drop it, it will fall to the ground. 
However, once you get to the quantum level, everything goes squirrely. You can't be certain what subatomic particles will do. For example, from the subatomic perspective, if you drop an apple, it may or may not hit the ground. It's enough to make your head hurt. Two years after Deming tried to enlist for the Mexican border war, Einstein published his now famous paper on relativity. Others quickly built on his work over the 1920s, including Niels Bohr of World War II Manhattan Project fame and Erwin Schrodinger. These physicists' discoveries were just pieces of a much bigger shift, the rise of what some have called non-determinism. Before, the world was seen through the lens of determinism. If I drop this apple, it will fall. One scientist put it something like this, If you can give me all the variables in existence, I can tell you everything that will ever happen. In simpler terms, the world operates solely on cause and effect. Take the weather, for instance. Decades ago, meteorologists believed that if they knew all the variables, such as humidity, wind direction, barometric pressure, and other such factors, they could predict the weather with 100% accuracy. In fact, the earliest computers were created expressly for calculating all these variables. But even with the advances in technology we have today, meteorologists are never spot on all the time. Even with being able to calculate every variable, there's still randomness. They can't tell us for certain what will happen, only how probable it is that we'll have a sunny day. This is what physicist Max Planck, the father of quantum mechanics, Einstein, and others observed. No matter how much you know, there is an infinite amount of chance and randomness in the universe. Therefore, there can be no such thing as absolute certainty. The world is constantly in flux. Non-determinism has its roots in Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. If you cross a black cow and black cow, the offspring will probably be another black cow, but a gene might mutate and result in a two-headed white calf. You just can't ever be certain. Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg took this idea to its extreme with the Copenhagen interpretation. Erwin Schrodinger gave us an easy way to understand how those two physicists saw the way the world works. Say you put a cat in a sealed box. Inside, there are two items. One is a can of poisonous gas. The other is a radioactive isotope giving off gamma rays. When the isotope decays and releases gamma rays, it triggers the poison gas. The cat dies. The catch is you can't predict when the isotope will decay. Radioactive decay can be random. No two isotopes decay at the same rate. It could decay in a minute or in a thousand years. Therefore, you'll never know when the isotope in the box will decay, triggering the poisonous gas. According to Bohr and Heisenberg, since you can't predict when the element will decay, you can never be sure at any given moment whether the cat is dead or alive. Until you open the box to see for yourself, you have to simultaneously assume that the cat is alive and that it's dead. Schrodinger's thought experiment here was to show the absurdity of those physicists' extreme and extremely theoretical view. While this cat-in-the-box concept is funny, it gives you an idea of how these two schools of thought differed. Determinism saw the world in black and white to cause and effect. With enough information, you could control any situation. Non-determinism saw the world in shades of gray. Everything has an element of randomness. Much of how the world works is unknowable. Mathematical formulas don't always hold true. We can't accurately predict the future. We can only speak in probabilities. The apple will more than likely hit the ground, but we can't say that with 100% certainty. This idea of non-determinism, that reality is inherently random, would form the basis of the professor's worldview when he began his academic career. It taught him to see the world as a series of interconnected systems, sparking the beginning of his questioning knowledge, i.e., how do we know what we know? While the old guard defended determinism, throughout his career Deming used this new worldview to disturb the status quo, solidifying his membership in what Frank Vole called the Monkey Wrench Gang. From the beginning, Deming was a pioneer in new ways of thinking. Missing the Forest for the Trees Let's look at a real-life example of non-determinism. Post-World War II, the island of Borneo in Southeast Asia had a serious malaria problem. In 1952, the World Health Organization, or WHO, of the newly formed United Nations sent anti-malarial experts to address the situation. One of the primary carriers of malaria is mosquitoes. 
Over the next three years, the WHO sprayed the chemical pesticide DDT on interior surfaces in the village longhouses, each of which housed about 100 families. After malaria cases sharply declined, the WHO declared mission accomplished and proceeded to host a world assembly in Mexico City to extol the virtues of DDT. Five years after the conference, Borneo started raining cats. Literally. And not just any cats. These were special cats. 23 rat catchers that floated down in their very own little cat parachutes from a British Royal Air Force transport plane. The cat's mission to replenish the island's feline population. What happened to the native cats? As it turns out, DDT killed more than mosquitoes. Later autopsies revealed that the WHO's practices resulted in lethal amounts of DDT accumulating in cats. Without their natural predator, the rat population exploded. Rats don't just eat crops, they carry diseases. In Borneo's case, typhus and sylvatic plague the same bacterium causing the bubonic plague of Black Plague fame. Nature could reset the ratio of cats to rats elsewhere, perhaps, but Borneo is an island. If all the cats die, there are no more cats. To remedy the WHO's mistake, the RAF flew 23 cats, plus three tons of food and supplies, blessed them to go forth and multiply, and let her rip. I imagine it was a carnival of carnivorous and carnal delight. The good folks at the WHO made an honest mistake. The Western education system stresses analytical, deterministic thinking. In this case, it led to this line of reasoning. Malaria is bad in Borneo. Malaria is carried by mosquitoes. DDT kills mosquitoes. Therefore, we should use DDT to kill the mosquitoes in Borneo. Cats killing rats and therefore keeping typhus at manageable levels is what Donella Meadows in Thinking in Systems calls a balancing feedback loop. However, when the cat population was out of balance, the natural order to things oscillated, creating what she describes as an overshoot of a reinforcing feedback loop. If the WHO had embraced non-deterministic thinking, they would have taken a much wider view of the problem. The opposite of analytic thinking is systems thinking, a.k.a. appreciation of a system, the ability to see how one thing is part of a larger, connected system. Someone who approached the ecosystem as, you know, a system, might have thought along these lines. Malaria is bad in Borneo. Malaria is carried by mosquitoes. DDT kills mosquitoes. But what else could it kill? What else would spraying DDT on the inside of longhouses affect? Do we have enough information to make an overall decision? Therefore, we should hold back the DDT Kool-Aid drinkers until we can be reasonably sure we're going to make things better and not worse for the people of Borneo. The WHO focused only on the immediate problem, not considering how one solution might trigger a chain reaction. This is exactly what I meant earlier about profound knowledge. Profound change requires profound knowledge, and one of the tenets of profound knowledge is systems thinking, an ability to see the situation in its greater context. Determinism and analytical thinking break down a problem into tiny pieces. Non-determinism and systems thinking look at a problem in the bigger picture. Analytical thinkers say, mission accomplished, now let's go home. System thinkers say, what were the results? Now let's make it even better. The thing about systems is that they're always changing. Nothing ever stands still. There's never a place where you reach perfection, because by the time you get there, things will have changed. This was bleeding-edge thinking when a 16-year-old's train rolled into Laramie, Wyoming. The professor was going to college. When the professor became the student. Ed, as he would come to introduce himself, was used to shouldering a heavy load and expected things to be no different at the University of Wyoming. In fact, he decided to major in electrical engineering. Electricity at the time was still at the forefront of technological progress, so this would have been like majoring in artificial intelligence or quantum computing today. He arrived to town days early to find a job. As he studied electrical engineering over the next four years, he supported himself by working as a janitor for 25 cents an hour, shoveling snow, and cutting ice. He also cut railroad ties and worked at a dry cleaners. 
At some point, he was a soda jerk serving up malted milkshakes. On top of his working hours to put himself through college, he also sang in a church choir and played the piccolo in the university's marching band. This blue-collar work ethic, as well as his continued pursuit of service and the arts, would set the pattern for the rest of his life. Ed was self-sufficient, yet always found time to help those in need. He would become a quintessential Renaissance man. During his early years at college, the Spanish flu swept the world. An estimated 500 million people were infected. Perhaps as many as 50 million people died. In the U.S., the death toll eventually tallied 675,000 Americans. Back home in Powell, Deming's family was spared, but the town lost their doctor. Ed graduated in four years, but stayed for a fifth to study mathematics. His new engineering degree qualified him to teach. Albeit very badly. He noted. How could I do otherwise? I didn't know very much. Years later, the professor would ultimately fulfill his destiny and become a true professor. The next year, he taught engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. He would continue to teach at the university level for the rest of his life, forever possessing the heart of a teacher. The year following, he enrolled at the University of Colorado for a master's in physics and mathematics. After graduating in 1924, one of his instructors encouraged him to continue with his studies, perhaps at Yale. He moved to New Haven, where, three years later, he would earn his Ph.D. in mathematical physics. Why mathematical physics? As we discussed earlier, the school of non-determinism says you can't know anything for certain. You can only say what will probably happen. As such, one vital component of non-determinism is the study of probabilities, specifically statistics, which mathematical physics relies on. One developing field of science that made good use of statistical probability was gases. When a substance is in a gaseous state, you can't predict where its component particles are. You can only calculate the probability of where they may be. Ed made a contribution to the field with his doctoral dissertation by studying the packing effect of helium, examining how many atoms actually occupy a given space. The 1920s were an exciting time for scientific discovery. The year Ed finished his formal schooling, the 5th Solvay Conference on Physics was held. The subject was electrons and photons. In attendance were some of the most famous names in science to this day, including Marie Curie, Edwin Schrödinger, Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, and Werner Heisenberg. The conference spawned an explosion in scientific thought and discovery based on non-determinism. Over time, Ed would become intimately familiar with all of these concepts. Non-determinism played a crucial role in shaping his worldview and began to lay the foundations for what would become SOPK. For one, it taught him that long-established and long-held beliefs weren't necessarily true. The entire structure of the physical world was being rethought and re-examined. Secondly, it showed him that the underpinnings of our very existence are random. The idea of randomness would be borne out through his fascination with statistics that, in turn, would inform his understanding of variation, something that would become one of the four cornerstones of profound knowledge. Thirdly, it taught him to look beyond black and white cause and effect. It forced him to look at problems as multifaceted, complex systems where changing one factor might have far-reaching and unintended consequences. During the two summers between Yale's academic calendar, Ed Deming, now a university faculty member with a bachelor's in engineering and a master's in physics, supported himself and his wife. He'd married a schoolteacher, Agnes, in 1923, as ever, by working. Then, Ed took an internship in a Chicago sweatshop called Hawthorne Works. Chapter 3. The Jungle in Paradise The supposition is uh, prevalent the world over that there would be no problems uh, in production or uh, service if only our production workers would do their jobs in the way that they were taught. Mm. Pleasant dreams. The workers are handicapped by the system, and the system belongs to the management. Dr. W. Edwards Dimming. 
All that remains of the grand social experiment at one of the greatest industrial sites in U.S. history, known as Hawthorne Works, is a stone tower at the corner of Cicero Avenue and Cermak Road just outside Chicago. Few realize its story is nothing less than the story of the rise and fall of urban industrial America in the 20th century. It played a crucial role in the history of manufacturing, as well as in Deming's own development, shaping the foundation of his ideas that would, decades later, change the world. Interestingly, virtually no one knows the crucial role the site played in space exploration as well. Mission Control, the Eagle has landed. Neil Armstrong was the first person to step foot on the moon. Gene Cernan, commander of the Apollo 17 mission, was the last. Cernan came to NASA via the U.S. Navy, where he'd served as a naval aviator. Through skill and circumstance, he earned his wings in only 10 months. In the pinning ceremony, his mother had the honor of affixing his gold wings to his dress blues. It would have been a proud moment for anyone, but there was some extra significance in Rose Cernan's act. You see, Gene's path to becoming a lunar astronaut began by studying electrical engineering at the prestigious College of Engineering at Purdue University. Even with a partial ROTC scholarship, the only way his family could feasibly afford his education was because of Rose. She worked for years in manufacturing to support her son through school. Her career began at Hawthorne Works. As luck would have it, this was where Ed would intern in the 1920s. The site would become the beginning of his journey towards profound knowledge. Hawthorne Works Hard work was a fact of life in Rose's immigrant family. Although she was born in Chicago in 1903, her parents were born in Bohemia before the region became part of the Czech Republic. Having immigrated to the U.S. shortly before the turn of the century and settling down in the Czech Slavic immigrant community outside Chicago in Hawthorne, now swallowed up by the township of Cicero. Franteschik and Rosalie Seeler, anglicized to Frank and Rose Seeler, married and gave birth to the astronaut's mother, also named Rose. We don't know when she began working, but we do know that in 1919, making her 16 years old at the time, Rose Seeler worked as an assembly line inspector at a nearby factory. Just down the road sat Chicago's famous meatpacking district, the subject of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, 13 years prior, that exposed the harsh working conditions and unsanitary environment of such sweatshops. In the early 1900s, Hawthorne was the Silicon Valley of its time, a hub of innovation, home of cutting-edge technology, an object of national fascination. If the discovery of electricity was magical, the invention of telephony was miraculous. Light bulbs were an upgrade from candles, sure, but a telephone... Well, there had never been anything like it. If a beloved aunt went to live with family out west, you may not ever see her again. It wasn't called the Wild West for nothing. You could write letters back and forth, but that was it. To be able to pick up a device and hear her voice? To have a conversation as if she were sitting across the table from you sharing a pot of coffee? Before telephones, that was unimaginable for the average person. Hawthorne Works. 100 Buildings. 200 acres, 5 million square feet of workspace, known as the electrical capital of America. Today, the city of Seattle stands for tech and coffee. Wall Street stands for finance. L.A. means movies. In the early 1900s, Pittsburgh, as well as Gary, Indiana, stood for steel. Detroit was Motor City. Hawthorne, Illinois, meant telephones. In many ways, Hawthorne looked like a company town, like those of Henry Ford's car factories or Milton Hershey's chocolate factory. In the modern era, Phillips Petroleum had Bartlesville, Oklahoma. When I worked as a programmer at Exxon in Houston in the 80s, the company seriously considered turning Conroe, Texas into a company town. All workers who weren't physically needed at the pipelines and plants would be relocated to Conroe, complete with housing developments and planned communities. Hawthorne had its own power plant, hospital, fire department, railroad, and everything else a town built around a factory needed. Inside the factory of Hawthorne Works, it was a sweatshop with the rigors and dangers you might expect. Once workers walked out the gates, however, they were on their own. One hallmark of company towns was that the company controlled every facet of a worker's life. 
They owned the commissary, workers' homes, the bank that loaned money to the workers to buy their company-owned homes, everything. It was the industrial equivalent of the hacienda system in Latin America, the Jim Crow era sharecropper system, and other such paternalistic arrangements throughout the world. You did the work, and the patron took care of everything else, the original cradle-to-grave arrangement. Not so in Hawthorne. Everything inside the factory belonged to Western Electric, the manufacturing division of America Telephone and Telegraph, which today we call AT&T. Everything outside the factory was privately owned, privately financed, and privately organized. The employees had their own sports teams, allowing Hawthorne Works to sponsor them. More importantly for Rose Sealer, employees created their own savings and loans clubs to lend money to their peers to build their own homes and buy their own cars, allowing them to build personal wealth. No doubt this played an important role in Rose's ability to later send her son to Purdue. The typical company town didn't have this. Workers were more or less dependent family members, if you will, of a massive family business. A few patriarchs at the top dictated the lives of everyone else. The difference at Hawthorne arose from Western Electric's approach to its workers, considered revolutionary at the time. Workers not only got vacations, but paid vacations, not to mention retirement planning and company pensions. In many ways, the company treated its workers more like partners than peasants. It was a beautiful social experiment. And it worked. According to one source, Year after year, Hawthorne's workers turned out an endless stream of complex communications apparatus engineered by the sharpest minds in the field and assembled by skilled craftsmen. In its time, Hawthorne Works exemplified the virtuous circle, a win-win proposition whereby corporate success forged a bond of loyalty with its employees. There was a sense of community and identity. Employees didn't merely work on assembly lines. They built the telephones connecting the nation. The factory existed for a decade before the first successful cross-country phone call was made between San Francisco and New York in 1915. The workers of Hawthorne understood the significance of the work that came out of their factory, and they were part of it. Ed experienced this esprit de corps when he interned at Hawthorne Works during the summers of 1925 and 26. Decades later, Ed would find the same kind of relationship between Japanese companies and their workers. There was a profound sense of pride. The workers at Toyota weren't just making rivets and welds, but the cars their neighbors drove. Products went out into the world representing Japan and helping to rebuild the nation. Japanese workers believed they were doing something that mattered. Hawthorne was the seedbed for Ed's understanding of profound knowledge. Though he wouldn't fully appreciate it until after he left, the factory was a testing ground for the theory of knowledge, led by the creator behind the theory of variation. Crucially, it gave Ed an appreciation for how human psychology affected a system. The entire operation was a masterwork of systems thinking. Without his internship at Hawthorne, who knows how different history would have been. The Makings of Modern American Management While the people of Hawthorne created their own little version of Utopia during the 1920s, across the street, literally, another team of people were building a different kind of Utopia, one that revolved around bootlegged liquor, gambling dens, and houses of ill repute. At the center of it all, the legendary Al Capone. The municipality of Hawthorne butted up against the municipality of Cicero, and Cicero in the 1920s meant Al Capone. Some of the buildings across from the plant were gambling houses with innocent-looking fronts but with entrances in the rear. They were, of course, illegal, but they were located on the Cicero side of the municipal boundaries. Chicago's finest had begun to crack down on Capone's operations in the city, so the gangster relocated to Cicero as his base of operations. The year before Ed would arrive, Capone's gang kidnapped, beat, and even shot police and poll workers in order to rig the elections. Cicero became his little kingdom. I think money came too hard for Ed to gamble it away, and I think he was too devout to partake in the other vices Cicero offered. However, knowing how much he would come to love gin in his later years, I can't help but wonder whether Ed ever drank some of Al Capone's bootleg liquor. Stepping back across the street to Hawthorne Works, 
Beyond being an impressive industrial site, the works site became a lab of sorts. The works bustling shops provided the perfect setting for testing new manufacturing methods, and company officials gladly served up employees as subjects for groundbreaking studies. That is, the workers became lab rats. John Scully, former CEO of Apple, once accused Taylor and Ford as the heavy hands that hold the American economy hostage. He was referring to Frederick Winslow Taylor, the father of Taylorism, and Henry Ford, who in the process of creating an automobile empire, created what came to be known as Fordism. Taylor died the same year the first coast-to-coast phone call was made in 1915. Henry Ford had passed on his business empire to his son Edsel by 1919, but their legacies left an indelible imprint on how to manage workers. Ford's genius wasn't the automobile, that had already been invented, but rather the efficient assembly line. He spent countless hours creating production systems and then endlessly improving them. When he first began to make cars, it took a bevy of specialized craftsmen half a day. When he opened his new factory in 1913, it took only 90 minutes to create a Model T. The drawback for the workers was that Ford saw them as inconvenient cogs in the machine. He sought to standardize operations to the point that a worker could be as interchangeable as any other piece of the system. Where Ford's approach was driven by practical matters, Taylor's approach was more scientific in nature, giving rise to the term scientific management. In layperson's terms, where Ford treated people like cogs in a machine, Taylor approached workers as if they were machines themselves. Machines that could be optimized for maximum efficiency given the right physical and psychological conditions. Building on Taylor's work, psychologist Elton Mayo conducted an experiment at Hawthorne Works from 1924 to 1927. His social experiment measured the change in workers' output at different levels of lighting. He found that any change in lighting increased employee productivity, leading to the term the Hawthorne effect. As it turned out, the rise in output came from workers knowing they were being closely watched, not from how much light they had available. I believe John Scully's dramatic summation of the two figures' continued influence came from the fact that much of America's economy had fundamentally changed even while the science of management had stagnated. The most valued workers weren't the ones with the strongest backs or greatest endurance. We had shifted into the knowledge economy, where the most prized skills were innovation and creativity, the antithesis of Ford's approach to management and a fundamentally different perspective than Taylor's. We see the effects of Fordism and Taylorism today, whether it be at a nonprofit healthcare organization, a manufacturing plant, a tech startup, or a global consultancy. Josh Corman, featured in Chapter 19, was on the Congressional COVID Task Force of Operation Warp Speed, the Trump administration's COVID-19 vaccine development and distribution efforts, and was the chief strategist at the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. He observed that even the U.S. government is still very much structured according to the Ford-slash-Detroit model of work. Managers see it as their job to use whatever tools necessary to wring as many widgets as possible out of those they supervise. What they call their widget doesn't matter. Software releases, electrical relays, number of customers served, whatever it is, it's management's job to get their workers to process as many of them as possible. To be blunt, this perspective is based on the idea that workers don't want to work, that given the opportunity, they will shirk as much as possible and be as lazy as they can. There's an assumption of underlying antagonism between them, the workers, and us, the managers. The result of this was the horror stories of Sinclair's The Jungle, the meatpacking factory expose mentioned earlier. While Western Electric may have taken a more collaborative approach with the township, Hawthorne Works was still a sweatshop, albeit an enlightened one. In the middle of Mayo's Hawthorne Effect studies, Ed rolled into town. The 24-year-old electrical engineer studying for his Ph.D. would spend four months that summer and the next one researching electrical transistors. Remember that Ed was an insatiable learner. I have no doubt he absorbed everything he possibly could about Hawthorne Works, far beyond the research and development department, closely observing Mayo's lighting experiments while simultaneously studying the theory behind the management of Hawthorne. These experiences left a lasting mark on Ed, ultimately leading to one of his four cornerstones of profound knowledge, that of human psychology and motivation. 
His future views on management would stand in direct opposition to the methods of Ford and Taylor, providing for the first time an alternative to the way business has always been done. The Lowest Degradation of Man I imagine Deming chose his summer job for the same reason a college kid might intern for free in Silicon Valley, to have a front-row seat at the cutting edge of innovation, landing a role in research and development. While his Ivy League education may have prepared him to appreciate and absorb the concepts floating around Hawthorne, it was his rural raising that prepared him for the -the on-the-ground reality. His upbringing allowed him to empathize with the harsh conditions of the working-class people all around him. The fact that Hawthorne was the foremost industrial site in the nation didn't change the horrendous working conditions endured by the thousands of people around him. It was still a hard scrabble life, just at an industrial scale. By the time he stepped off the trolley in 1925, Hawthorne Works employed around 40,000 people, mostly women. A friend of his had forewarned him to stay well away from the stairway when the whistle blew at the end of the day. Those women will trample you to death. There won't even be an oil slick. Later, Deming would reflect, It was hot. It was dirty. No wonder they wanted to get out. Ed held a particularly low view of a mainstay of American factories at the time. Piecework, where a worker got paid according to the number of units produced or tasks performed. For instance, Rose might have been paid according to how many telephone assemblages she inspected. Deming would later observe, At the end of the day, piecework is man's lowest degradation. That type of pay scheme incentivized workers to focus on quantity, not quality. It was harder to take pride in their workmanship because they knew that each person working on the telephone unit before it got to them had done a rush job. No wonder managers working under Taylorism were so suspicious and antagonistic toward the line workers. The managers followed a system where shoddy workmanship was incentivized from the beginning. Most regard Taylor either as a hero or a monster. During many of my conference presentations, I'll often tell my audience to hold up their smartphones for a moment. Then I say, you wouldn't have that if it weren't for Taylor. His scientific management approach essentially systemized factories' workflows, allowing for far greater efficiencies. We have Taylorism and Fordism to thank for playing no small part in the second industrial revolution when standardization, mass production, and industrialization came to the fore. Frederick Taylor and Henry Ford were far from perfect. Nevertheless, we wouldn't have progressed to the point we are today without them. Ever the philomath, Ed was curious about everything around him. It was his good fortune to wind up at Hawthorne Works, where he could be exposed to the latest in production processes, as well as the social experiment that was the town of Hawthorne. I cannot imagine that he worked there for eight months over two years without indirectly coming across the work of Dr. Walter Schuert. Unbeknownst to Ed, his relationship with the AT&T physicist researcher would become a defining factor in his life, as we'll soon see. Ed's time at Hawthorne Works exposed him to new ideas about manufacturing and labor. Workers' autonomy outside of the factory led to a community not dictated by company patronage, but one led by the community itself. The result was independent-minded individuals like Rose Seeler. Without her experience at Hawthorne Works, I don't know that she'd go on to work for an electrical manufacturer as a married woman with children in those early decades when women were still expected to adhere to their traditional domestic roles. Without her own income, her son wouldn't have gone to Purdue, nor started down the path to becoming the commander of the Apollo 17 mission. Hawthorne Works' progressive arrangement for its time prepared Ed to appreciate how companies and their employees could work together for the common good. When he landed in Japan, he, more than any of the Americans there, immediately grasped how crucial the special arrangement between Japanese companies and their employees was, and why it led to superior quality. This line of thinking would become what I believe is the striking difference between SOPK and Western management. Ed discovered a human-centered approach to systems in general, and business in particular. But before he could begin to articulate SOPK, he had to learn from the master of variation. And to understand variation, we have to first appreciate the history of quality control.